Another year, another unrelenting barrage of Star Wars releases. There is truly no escape from the galaxy far, far away, unless, of course, you get a ride with some whales or build a big hyperspace ring. But since no one will let me do either, there's all this stuff that I'm forced to have opinions about until the day I die. And thanks to some innate character flaw, I am compelled to share my opinions with you. So strap in, because 2023 was an interesting year for Star Wars quality, and I'd like to dive into why. I was thinking of covering news as well as releases, but it's quite hard to form an opinion on untitled Star Wars movie number four, so I'm just going to be focusing on the stuff that's come out this year, starting with The Bad Batch Season 2. I'm glad we're starting with something I like, because it will make me seem less grumpy, but yeah, there's a lot to like about this season of The Bad Batch. Uh, I really, really appreciated the, the strong character work pretty much across the board. Uh, I think in an era where emotions and relationships can sometimes feel like an afterthought in Star Wars storytelling, it's really nice to have that kind of front and center. And I guess the most obvious version of this is, is with Omega. She is kind of still, in a lot of ways, the character we're following through all of this. She's the, the young character who is maturing and becoming part of the group, part of Clone Force 99, and just seeing her mature and seeing her really take her place as a member of the squad and not a kind of liability that they're looking after, really great stuff, and it kind of mirrors what Ahsoka went through in the Clone Wars, or maybe what Ezra went through in Rebels, but not in a way that's like, I've seen this before, more in a way that's just... Great, great to see. And Omega is not Ahsoka and she's not Ezra. She is a wonderful character in her own right. It's so lovely to have a character who's driven by selflessness and kindness and, and, and love uh, in such a kind of unambiguous way. Something I appreciated this time round was the balance between all the squad members when it came to focus within the stories. Uh, I think everyone got their chance to shine, uh, which I think really contrasts to season one where it really was a Hunter's show a lot of the time. And uh, yeah, I, well, obviously Crosshair's show as well, but I think a lot of people will mention Tech as the star of this season, and he really was a star. He he was fleshed out in such a lovely, heartfelt way. It felt it felt like the writers were going, God, we really love Tech, don't we? And, and as an audience member, you go, yeah, we do love Tech, don't we? Um, but I think as a fan of the Clone Wars and a fan of uh, the Domino Squad arcs, I was very very happy to see that Echo really got a lot to do as well. Uh, he's always been my favourite of the crew, but not because of what he does in this show. I think in season one he hardly had anything to do, but this time around I'm like, that's my guy, that's Echo, I'm, I'm really happy to see that. I think Crosshair's story remains a standout, I think, especially with him being with the Empire, you really get to see the, the Imperial clone perspective on this time period. And this time period is fascinating, and this season especially, it plays to the strengths of the fact that the Bad Batch is a Clone Wars sequel, like it, it draws upon all these threads that were kind of set up, and some questions that we've had for years about what happened to the clones, how was that decommissioning process for them, considering how busy the 20 year period following Revenge of the Sith is now with Star Wars stories, it's amazing how many twists and turns the story is capable of really, and how many moments of oh my god, is this is this what's happening and and things like that, and oh, oh how's this conspiracy going to unfold and what is this going to mean for our main characters and what are they doing on that mountain where they seem to be doing kind of weird clone stuff uh, my opinions on that kind of depend on the payoff, uh, because I, whenever it gets into clone territory that isn't relating to the Django Fett clones, I'm kind of like, are you doing Rise of Skywalker? Are you doing clone Luke Skywalker? What are, what are you doing here? Are you doing the Emperor? This is, uh, this is weird territory to get into, but no, I'm enjoying the intrigue. And there were some really effective emotional beats this season. The storytelling across the board was, was very strong. The visuals have pushed past pretty much everything we thought was possible in this Clone Wars style. This is a really good looking season. Uh, it's all elevated by a fantastic score, by the Kiners. Yeah, just a lot of great stuff all round. I think if I had a single gripe, it would be kind of the dialogue. It, it can feel a little like... Uh, you know, this is still a Cartoon Network show for children where everything is blatant and allergic to subtlety. And uh, I, 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 it's interesting that it, it kind of sometimes still feels like that Clone Wars kids show, where in a lot of other ways it is a show that has matured with its audience, with the Clone Wars audience from, from 15 years ago. And it's like, is this for kids? It, sometimes it feels like it is, sometimes it feels like it isn't. I'm not even sure kids would like it, uh, but that that's an interesting kind of byproduct of, you know, the Clone Wars grew up with its audience, but at least it then ended. But Bad Batch now exists as this kind of half-adult, half-kid-oriented kind of show. Interesting, um, I guess, you know, it's interesting. It's not 
a major deal. It doesn't really hold back the show. I like the fact that they're saying anything at all. You know, the fact the characters have something to say does make it worthwhile that they're, you know, saying it a little too obviously and on the nose. But but yeah, no, this isn't the show, I don't think, that is going to convince you uh, that Star Wars animation is good. I think if you're not a fan of The Clone Wars or a fan of Rebels, this isn't going to be, oh, you know what, I get it. But if you are a fan of those other shows and, and Resistance, because it's a lot of lot of the similar team, um, and if you haven't checked out Bad Batch or if you gave up in season one, I, I would give it a go. It's it, it's good. It's, uh, it's a really strong, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to rewatch a lot of it ahead of season three. But yeah, Bad Batch Season 2 gets uh, a J-Boy thumbs up, which I guess is how we're rating these things. <laughs> it's a surprise to me. I'm sure it was also a surprise to you. The Mandalorian Season 3. It's the same show it's always been in the worst possible way. It has completely stagnated. The flaws that have always been part of the show are way more present than ever, and the redeeming qualities have just become harder and harder to find since season one. The characters, if you can call them that, have regressed even further into dull, quote-spouting vacuums of personality. They're almost like what I would do as a parody of a Jon Favreau-written character. Jon Favreau has returned to write every single episode of this season, uh, which is incredibly obvious. Din Djarin, as a protagonist, is more passive than ever. He seems to have no place in this story and no real investment in it either. The stoic delivery of the lines by Pascal, matched with the stupid moronic dialogue, makes it sound almost like he's concussed for the entire season. But it's not just the main character that's the problem. Everyone is stupid. Everyone is boring. No one has any kind of snappy interaction or a conversation that makes you think about anything or, or feel for anyone or get in any way invested in what's going to happen to anything. Everything just plods along in a purposeless journey to nowhere and then shows you a fucking X wing so you tune in next week. The status quo cannot be changed for more than 10 minutes because then we wouldn't be able to sell as many toys. Um, plot lines that were set up in season one are discarded in resolutions that make them feel like afterthoughts. Moff Gideon's plan this whole time is something that we've never really known about. It's this mysterious thing that's meant to make us go, ooh, what's he working on? What's all this? You know, there's all these teases, all this everything. But in doing so, it does keep us kind of at arm's length from him. You know, by getting the mystery, you kind of sacrifice our kind of investment a little bit. But I guess what it's banking on is that, oh, what's the payoff going to be? That, that intrigue. And it turns out that he is getting baby Yoda's DNA so that he can make clones of himself that have the force. Which sounds incredibly stupid and hilarious, but it's, it's actually not very funny. It's just boring. <laughs> um... But the thing about this plan is, it, it's not like Gideon reveals his plan, we all go, wow, this is awful, how are they going to stop it? And then the point of the episode is, let's stop Gideon. The, the, the way we find out this plan is that Din Djarin stumbles into a room full of Gideon test tubes, and stumbles onto a button that explodes the whole thing, and it goes, oh, didn't know what that was, but guess we don't have to worry about it now. And then Gideon goes, hey, those were my clones, I was going to give them the force. And it's like, that is completely backwards that is the opposite way around <laughs> you know you that would be like if they blew up the death star in a new hope without revealing what it did and then vader going god it's a shame they blew that up we were gonna we were gonna destroy planets with that see it sounds almost funny but it's not really it's just kind of vapid it leaves your brain as soon as you finish watching it and there's not really a huge amount to talk about for the whole season and obviously here's me talking about it but you know the format demands it i can't think of much else to say as far as negatives go because it's just the whole thing the whole thing is just a worthless sludge and uh this is what i said about me sounding grumpy later on in the video um let's look for positives i liked when the baby was in a robot i kind of liked some of the like new republic stuff in that episode that didn't have any of the stupid main characters i liked when i was at star wars celebration and i walked past the the main stage and saw that people were just being let in to an early screening of one of the episodes and i said can i go in and, and they said yes um the cast and crew were there i gave them a polite clap it was nice to see a star wars on the big screen I think those are all the positives I have. Um, did anyone enjoy this season? Did anyone love it? I mean, this is a, maybe a genuine question. Are we all kind of in agreement that this just washed over us? And if we, even if we don't hate it, it just kind of disappeared as, as a, a big load of nothing. Um, I ask because it, that's the sense I get at this point that 
any of the positivity that I saw wore off. It may be that the people that love this and really thought, you know what, this this is my jam, this is my Star Wars, it may be that they've just all blocked me on Twitter for being a grumpy bastard. And you know what, I don't blame them. Uh, but yeah, unsurprisingly, this Mandalorian Season 3 gets a defeated J-Boy thumbs down. On to the next thing. Star Wars Visions. How great that I now get to talk about something that I love. I don't know what we did to deserve this, really. Nine animated short films from studios across the world. It's just too good to be true, really. I'm going to try and briefly cover all nine of them, because I don't think it can be grouped as one thing. I know people talk about it like it's a TV season, but it, they're short films. They are kind of an anthology series here. And uh, yeah, let's talk about them all. Sith gets us off to a really visually impressive start. I think the whole short is really just a showcase of this distinct style in a Star Wars kind of context and it's really fantastic to look at. There's some cool symbolism within the artwork and that the story that they're telling is very much done in a visual way which means the kind of dialogue side of the story and the more kind of plot driven story stuff is less important and as a consequence less interesting uh, but hard to complain about when it looks so good really. Screech's Reach is one that I wasn't really taken with when this volume first dropped, but on rewatch, it really blew me away. I think it's it's a really incredible story about these kind of Dickensian workhouse children, and, and how one of them in particular feels this calling to, to, to something greater. And, and the way it all unfolds is, is fascinating and, and, and awful and great. The animation is breathtaking, the music is haunting, the story is emotional and surprising. This whole thing is just superb. One of these ones that you're sad that it's just a standalone thing, uh, and you'd love a follow-up, but at the same time works perfectly on its own. Just a great short. In the Stars maybe has my favourite of the animation styles this volume. Uh, it's just got this incredibly cool and unique aesthetic that fits the Star Wars iconography really perfectly. This is a story that has kind of rich historical parallels with the impact of the Empire's colonialism on an indigenous population. And uh, you're instantly invested and rooting for these main characters, especially the, the younger of the two sisters. She is just adorable. And there's such an emotional heart to this one. It's, it feels really personal. The story is engaging and moving, the music made a huge impact in a very short period of time, the ending made me cry, uh, there's a message about how eco-terrorism is cool, what more could you want? Uh, this is probably my favourite of the volume, I might change my mind as I talk about the others, but yeah, great stuff. I Am Your Mother is the one by Ardman, and it has all the humour and visual charm that you'd expect, wrapped up in a lovely little story. I especially appreciate that it's about a mother and daughter in a franchise that can feel very obsessed with fathers and sons. I love seeing things like the Ardman version of a Wookiee, or the Ardman version of a droid. Uh, the Ardman version of Wedge Antilles is a very comedic character, which I didn't necessarily expect, and it's, it's great to hear Dennis Lawson in the role. There's a really palpable heart to the whole thing. It feels just really lovely, small scale, personal, one of my favourite Aardman things in years and definitely one of my favourite Star Wars Visions entries. Journey to the Dark Head crams a lot of ideas into its very short runtime. To me it feels like the kind of pitch for a feature film that's just kind of been squished into an 18 minute kind of slot and you know, some of these ideas are really, really great, and the world building is fantastic, and there's some really intriguing stuff about oh, what what period is this set in, you know, uh, but kind of as a consequence of all of these things being shoved into a, a small you know, Star Wars Visions anthology format. Uh, I think the pacing suffers and the characters suffer. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's nothing to like about it. As I said, you know, the ideas that they are showing are pretty good, but it's quite hard to wrap your head around the kind of minutiae of it all when the broad strokes are very nice and the visuals are absolutely stunning and there's great symbolism that's done through these visuals. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a bit more of a mixed bag, mostly because it's a really, really full bag. Uh, but yeah, I didn't hate it, uh, I didn't love it, but I, I did like it. No, this was a this was a really cool one. The Spy Dancer is another story about motherhood. They're really spoiling us. I think this is what happens when you kind of give Star Wars to a more varied number of creatives. You kind of get stories that you don't really expect from Lucasfilm at the moment. This is a very simple premise, almost the opposite to the last one. It's not doing too much, but it's executing it flawlessly. It's The, the setup is that it's a performer in... I want to say Nazi-occupied Paris. It's not. It's Imperial-occupied uh, something, so some alien planet, but it is, it's essentially kind of occupied France in a way that's that's 
it's a French uh, short film as well. It's a French studio, so really cool to see the the direct allegory there. And and she's a performer, and she's dancing to to the imperial occupiers uh, while also spying on them for the rebellion. It feels silly mentioning the visuals at this point because they've all been good, but these ones are really pretty, and the dance itself is is kind of mesmerizing. She's got these flowy robes uh, in a way that sometimes looks like uh, the movie Nope. Uh, but yeah, mesmerizing is the word because she's deliberately distracting them. But the way the story unfolds with her involvement in the rebellion and you see kind of uh, what happened to her when she lost her son and and the kind of way that that comes back around and you know the the imperial leader who took her son and and how how he comes back into the story it's a really simple yet really effective short that uh, yeah I'm really glad exists the bandits of Golak is another simple one that really makes you want to see more from it uh, but not in a way that you know it's not giving you enough in itself it's one of the more overt depictions of a you know, a real world culture that's been Star Warsified, but it's done in a way that feels really authentic and really rich and a real testament to visions as a format, I suppose. It's maybe a shame the kind of brush stroke uh, paint uh, style that they have for the 3D, 3D animation is quite similar to what Clone Wars ended up looking like, uh, but I think it probably looks better than Clone Wars, so that's fine. I found the story very touching. It's about uh, an older brother looking after his younger force sensitive sister. Uh, as they're on the run from the Empire. And, and as, as an older brother myself to a wonderful sister, I thought, actually, that it was actually really moving. It's nice having Star Wars be so human and using family not as a kind of force lineage mystery box thing, but, you know, because of emotion and connection and love. Yeah, this is another good one. It's quite hard to have a kind of snappy conclusion about them when they're all just pretty good. Um, this one maybe is overshadowed a bit by the competition, but it, it's like that meme about having the two cakes. It's like, great, we get this thing that's really good and this thing that's really good. Um, yeah, how nice that something this cool isn't the best of the volume. The Pit, in a lot of ways, is not unlike Andor. It's a kind of brutal depiction of prisoners of the Empire and the way they kind of have to work themselves to death, in this case, mining a giant pit for the sake of kyber crystals. And also similar to Andor, it features some really emotionally overwhelming moments of a community coming together to support each other and rising up against the Empire. It's really effectively done despite a very short runtime. It's another short that knows the exact story it wants to tell, like a kind of microcosm of rebellion and uh, and community and things like that, and it's not trying to do too much. The visual style is less of the star this time, it's a bit less flashy, uh, although I did really enjoy seeing the time lapse of the city being built on the backs of the exploitation of these prisoners, really. I think having a time lapse like that is quite rare in Star Wars because everything has to be so rigidly fit into these timelines that being so liberal with the passage of time is quite rare. Now, this was one I really enjoyed and especially on rewatch actually i think the first time round maybe i just had nine vastly different short films buzzing around my head at once and it was quite hard to settle on any opinions on any of them but i think this time round i was really able to appreciate all of them Ao song is just beautiful. I know I said that one of the other ones was my favourite visual style, but while I watched this one I was like, it can't get better than this, surely. There's a phenomenal look and texture to everything, the characters, the landscapes, the combination of them both. It's so alive, it's so... you just want to go there, you just want to go and experience these landscapes. And I think obviously with Star Wars, you can so often have these barren landscapes, this kind of desolate, you know, lived in kind of Star Wars that's, you know, these worn down places and people and everything. Everything. To have something so luscious and wonderful is is a breath of fresh air. I was thinking with this one, if it hadn't been buried as like a Star Wars Visions Season 2 Episode 9, you know, if it had just been released without any kind of Star Wars iconography as its own film, feature film, short film, whatever, I think it would have made a really huge splash. I think people would have really paid attention to this. But, you know, obviously, why would a non-Star Wars fan watch something buried on the second half, the, you know, the end of the second volume of a series of Star Wars films. But honestly, I think this is something that could have had its own fandom. It could have had its own people invested in it because uh, it's it's just incredible. And I, I hope this, you know, I'll be following the work of this studio now because it's, it's, it's a really great piece of work. So that's Visions Volume 2. I feel like I've spent a lot of time talking about it, but yeah, as I said, there are nine things I had to cover and it wouldn't be fair to just paint everything with the same brush because they certainly didn't, you know. There was a real remarkable sense of, uh, of variety from these styles this time round. I mean, there was already a lovely visual kind of variety in, in Volume 1, uh, but that all being anime and this being from across so many places in the world, uh, just 
a wonderful, wonderful feast for the eyes. And it's so great seeing these studios bring, you know, their versions of Star Wars to the screen, their versions of vehicles, their versions of droids, of helmets. Sometimes it can feel like the design that happens in-house at Lucasfilm is more interested in imitation than innovation. So seeing these almost limitless ideas of what Star Wars can be is really great. And it's wonderful having these kind of cultural elements brought to Star Wars in a way that feels very authentic and like it's being done by people that understand that culture and it's not just a, a, a planet in the Clone Wars where someone's gone, make it a Japanese planet. I know there's been some discussion about how canon these are, and you know, technically they're non-canon, but I don't see that as a kind of exclusion. I see it more as, as freedom. It's it's the opportunity to do whatever you want without having to fit it into a specific place in the timeline. I think that is a great thing to be able to offer. And also, there's no reason not to believe them to be canon. I think until something like this is contradicted, you know, very explicitly in, in the Star Wars timeline, there's no reason not to. And the fact that all the the dates and the locations are so vague, there's no reason that any of these would be contradicted. I, I can't see any story going, oh, by the way, the I Am Your Mother Ardman short about the mother and daughter race uh, at the Flight Academy, that's not canon. Like, you can just, you can just enjoy it. I worry that this volume didn't make much of a splash. There was some buzz going into it, uh, you know, as the anticipation was building. Some buzz in the first few days, but then it has just kind of disappeared. And I really hope that people have seen these and they have, you know, thought about them and they've made the impact that they deserve to make because Visions is something that I kind of want to exist forever. If they just keep coming back and doing a volume of Star Wars short films every few years for as long as anyone's interested in making them, that would be incredible because it's such a treasure trove of visuals, of, of, of personal storytelling, of world building, of all these things, getting all these different versions of Star Wars. I mean, for some of these, I, I want these animation studios to be able to do more. I want them to make kind of feature films from these ideas. And, and I mean, that was the same with volume one. It was, well, why don't we take this and actually make something a little bit more kind of long term as a big event? You know, uh, I think so much of these have the potential to, you know, that the studios and even the stories have the potential to, to grow into something bigger. And that, that would be something I'd love to see. But right now I'm just reflecting on volume two as one of the high points of Star Wars this year. And Visions as a whole as one of the high points of Star Wars post Disney, and maybe ever. You know, it's just an incredible thing that I can't believe exists, and I just keep having to pinch myself that it does. This volume gets a big J-Boy thumbs up, one of the biggest. Maybe it should get nine big J-Boy thumbs up. Don't count how many that was, because I wasn't. Jedi Survivor. How nice to be able to continue the positivity, because we got a very good Star Wars game this year. I was a huge fan of Jedi Fallen Order, although I preferred the gameplay to the story by quite a considerable amount. Jedi Survivor takes everything that worked about that first game and improves it to an absurd degree. Starting with Cal Kestis himself. I know some people liked him in the first game, but I always found him to be a bit of a blank slate wet wipe. But he's so much better to spend a hundred hours with this time round. He has a Mario-esque moveset, he has a grapple hook, he has a gun, uh, but most shockingly, he has swag. You feel the improvements across the board. And again, I really like Jedi Fallen Order, but Survivor has more humour, more heart, more shocking moments in the story. Story, more of a reason to be invested and engaged in the lives of these characters. The world feels so alive, and they've very seamlessly integrated the High Republic time period in ways that are fresh, interesting, and exciting. The gameplay has been tightened up as well, it just feels so good to play. The level design is so clever, there are these vast, sprawling worlds that you can explore, and then it will very naturally funnel you into a linear challenge that you have to complete. Obviously that's not a unique thing in a video game, but I was kind of amazed at just how big and open it can feel and then immediately you're in you know a very typical kind of linear single player level Next year we're getting Star Wars Outlaws, which claims to be the first ever Star Wars open world game, and I'll be interested to see how it differentiates itself from Survivor. Because in this game, the planet of Kobo is an open world Star Wars game in itself, and a great one. There are side missions for you to do, wacky characters for you to talk to and recruit, a little hub that you can hang out in and grow in this village. Uh, there are these varied environments for you to explore all over the planet. There's a little Captain Toad guy who kind of pops up in every different location. Honestly, just talk Talking about it makes me want to go and play it again. 
The lightsaber combat is incredibly fun, as are the various force abilities. Uh, the graphics look absolutely incredible, like proper next-gen, current-gen stuff, just as good as a game has ever looked on PS5, I, I really do think. Uh, the score by uh, Stephen Barton and Gordy Harb is probably the closest a non-John Williams score has come to sounding like a John Williams Star Wars score. It's really, really special. It's a story that I'm really excited to see continued and to replay, and gameplay that will make doing so a real joy. Definitely a huge J-Boy thumbs up. One of my favourite Star Wars games of all time. And here comes Ahsoka to bring the positive vibes crashing down, which incidentally is what all the characters in Ahsoka say whenever she shows up. Uh, I think I've made my thoughts on this show very clear over on my Twitter and on a video in this channel that's very good and you should watch. But to summarise, it's a big load of nothing that squanders pretty much every potential positive element it stumbles upon with some of the flattest and most lifeless dialogue and direction that Star Wars has ever suffered from. It doesn't fall to some of the truly incompetent lows of some of the Mandoverse shows, but but at the same time, it doesn't give you any reason to care about any of the characters that it forces you to spend time with. If you want nuance, I like to think I was fair and balanced in the video I made, but if you want a concise verdict, it was a waste of time that I don't really feel like talking about for much longer. Uh, unsurprisingly, a J-Boy thumbs down. So I think that's it for this year. I know we were meant to get Skeleton Crew, but apparently that's now next year. Frankly, I'm not too heartbroken at having to wait a little bit longer for the next Mandoverse show. Oh, something else I watched this year was a bit of Young Jedi Adventures. I thought it was cute, lovely, and cool to have some High Republic stuff on the screen, but obviously I'm not the target audience, nor should I be, so I'm not gonna, you know, watch all of it or judge it as, as I will all the other things. Uh, no, I'm glad it exists and I hope that the kids are enjoying it. If I was a better fan, I'd tell you all about all the books and comics that I've read this year, but this was probably the worst year I've ever had for that because I have not read a single thing. Uh, maybe next year I'll have more to feed back on that front, but for now, I guess let's do a verdict. 2023, was it good? Was it bad? I would do a ranking of everything that I've mentioned here, but I think you could probably do that just based on my opinions. Uh, it's quite obvious what I like and what I don't. And that's the thing, really. It's uh, 2023... It's a balance, isn't it? It's a, it's a mixture. We had two things that I absolutely loved, one thing that I really liked, and two that I didn't really care for whatsoever. But I suppose if you want to get technical, Visions was actually nine things, so really, the good outweighs the bad by quite a lot. Reflecting on the big picture like this really helps because I think when you're six weeks into Ahsoka or The Mandalorian, it can kind of feel like grey sludge is all Star Wars is capable of, so kind of thinking that Star Wars Survivor and, you know, Star Wars Visions can exist alongside that is, is really encouraging. So, so yeah, I guess 2023 gets a J-Boy thumbs up, with some obvious caveats. I guess there is a difference between a year being good in isolation and being a good sign for what's to come, and that may be where 2023 starts to be complicated. The things I like are very much in their own pockets of Star Wars, you know, these, these isolated bubbles, and the things I don't like feel very much more the brand, so to speak. You know, it's, it's where Star Wars is headed, it's the stuff... Does that make sense? It feels like I'm just making up a reason to still be grumpy, but... I don't know, it feels like the stuff that's getting future stuff, you know, The Mandalorian and Ahsoka, they're getting future seasons, they're getting a, a spin-off movie, a, a, a crossover climactic cinematic finale, whereas the other ones, you know, it's great that they're able to exist, you know, I love that they can coexist. I guess they can sometimes feel like exceptions to the modern Lucasfilm kind of output, rather than representations of it, if that makes sense. The Bad Batch feels like a holdover from when animation was where Star Wars' storytelling priorities were. That was where it was pushing into exciting and interesting territory. Ahsoka and The Mandalorian have both picked up beloved animated plot threads this year and fucking butchered them. You know, I mourn the loss of the animated Rebels sequel that we thought we might one day get. And I'm very grateful that Bob Iger doesn't know what The Bad Batch is because I'm sure he would cancel it in a heartbeat. The show is ending next year, and there's no guarantee that a new show will come along and take its place. We don't know, now that live action seems to be so much of their priority, we can't take anything for granted. Jedi Survivor was amazing, but gaming is always this own little subsection of Star Wars, and luckily, I guess, optimistically, it always will be. Uh, but I guess if we're talking specifically about uh, the direction of that series, that trilogy of games, the Star Wars Jedi series, I guess it's called, Fallen Order Survivor, and the third one that they're working on, I'm a little worried for the third one, you know, um, the director of the first two, Stig Asmussen, he's not returning for the third one, so we'll have to see how that plays out, obviously I am still excited, but, you know, 
with a little caveat. That's the that's the issue is that all the things I love, there's a little bit of, oh, but this is great, but is it the end of this exact thing, you know? And the same goes for Star Wars Visions, you know? It feels like a miracle that it exists. And I guess I'm, every miracle that we get, I'm kind of like, is this the last miracle? Is this... Is this the last thing we get before it just descends into sludge content forever? And I guess something that exacerbates that is David Tennant's... David Tennant? I have been in Doctor Who mode. Dave Filoni's promotion to creative chief in charge and man of Lucasfilm. And I think he spoke about how there were all these projects that he was brought on to consult and things. And he was saying like, oh, with a lot of these projects, you know, I wasn't involved until they'd already developed without me. And he was saying that as if it was a bad thing. And uh, honestly, I think some of my favourite projects are the ones that are just a creative doing their thing on their own or with their team of people. And I, I think having the oversight of one particular man and his particular idea of Star Wars uh, and having that seep into every project at, at the kind of inception level of each each thing that they put into development, I think that's a mistake. Not just because I don't think that man is very good at making these things anymore, uh, but just because having a single vision rule everything is, is a bad idea to start with. I might have absolutely nothing to worry about on that front and there will be no difference whatsoever to how stuff gets made. But I guess I'm a little bit worried. We'll have to see. Uh, I did have some joyful Star Wars experiences this year. I met so many wonderful people at Star Wars Celebration. I have enjoyed, even with shows like Ahsoka and The Mandalorian, the weekly experience of discussing that with people on Twitter, with my friends, with members of the J-Boy army. Uh, that's just been a real blast. I loved seeing Return of the Jedi on the big screen for its 40th anniversary, and even The Mandalorian episode I saw at Celebration. I love Star Wars on the big screen, and to be honest, it made me baffled that cinematic releases don't seem to be Lucasfilm's priority at the moment. I wish we could look forward to one next year, you know. I guess by this time in 2024 we will know how real some of those untitled Star Wars movies that they've announced are. At the moment they feel just as likely to happen as the last 50 projects that they cancelled, uh, but we'll see. And I guess there is still quite a lot to look forward to in 2024, even without the movies that we're not getting. <laughs> I hope the Acolyte lives up to all the potential that it seems to have. The Bad Batch Season 3 I saw part of at Star Wars Celebration, and it looked really, really good. Um, Andor isn't coming next year because of corporate greed, keeping the strikes going for so long. But, you know, I guess hopefully it will impassion them to make a very anti-establishment Season 2 as well. Uh, but yeah, very excited for that. It will be worth the wait. What else are we getting next year? Tales of the Jedi... Could be good, could be bad. Skeleton crew, we know nothing. Um, but yeah, there's stuff to be excited about. What did you think of Star Wars this year? Did you love every minute of it? Did it give you everything you wanted and more? Uh, or did it maybe leave you feeling a bit cold? Or somewhere in the middle, did it just wash over you as a kind of unremarkable load of slop? I hope these questions aren't too loaded. Uh, but no, I'd love to know. Please tell me in the comments. I I've had some great conversations in the comments section recently, and I I'd love to keep those going for this, this topic. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. When I was planning my return to YouTube, I was thinking about all the projects that I wasn't able to talk about while I wasn't running this channel, and uh, I kind of thought that maybe a yearly roundup of Star Wars stuff would be a fun format to maybe do this year, maybe revisit. Let me know if that was something that would be something you're interested in, you know, going forward. Uh, this wasn't how I wanted to do the video. I wanted it to be properly scripted and edited like a proper Joe Brennan video. But I've had some surprising adventures this week and, to be honest, this month that have uh, kind of kept me from doing that. But I hope this format worked. Obviously, you know, the roundup format and also the more off-the-cuff conversational format that, that I hope I have achieved uh, with this one. Uh, please. Share this video with someone if you have enjoyed it. Share it on social medias. I don't get as many views on my Star Wars videos. And uh, to be honest, I think if I was any more view focused, I would go, well, maybe I won't do as many Star Wars videos. But frankly, I enjoy making them and I want to make them. So uh, if you could support them uh, and make that possible, if, if that, there'd be something you'd be interested in seeing, uh, I'd really appreciate that. And yeah, if you're new to the channel, hello, my name's Joe. Uh, subscribe you know, hit the bell, do all the things that YouTubers tell you to do. Um, I think that's all for me this year. I hope you have a wonderful new year, a wonderful holiday season. Um, I hope next year is better for you than this year. Even if this year was really good, I hope next year is an improvement. And I hope it's an improvement for Star Wars. I'm not sure if it will be. We'll have to see. I'm rambling. This is what happens when I don't have a script. Uh, but I'll see you very soon. Love you lots.